millions of people who are now not insecure, their brain is not occupied with like, how do I downsize and move out of my family into like a smaller home? If, if property rights exist at all, then that's certainly, you're not, you're still violating someone's rights by just saying, don't come onto my lane. And we have studies showing that IQ is related to poverty, right? So I want to say that there have been studies in the last 10 years that show that effective IQ is correlated to poverty. The easiest thing for me would be to say capitalism is better than communism. I should say the things have changed in some ways. You know, who is the determinant of the public interest? The more time people spend in digital worlds, the more of our lives we live there. Intercoin, bringing power to the people. Welcome, everybody. Today on the show, I have a pleasure of interviewing Bob Murphy, a well-known economist and anarcho-capitalist. I've been wanting to do this for a very long time, Bob. I think we've been speaking for a few years, right? And uh, we'll finally get to do this. So I'm very happy. Uh, let's start off by just uh, telling the audience, many of whom uh, may not be libertarians or anarcho-capitalists, uh, about yourself. How did you get into this? And like, what brought you to the Mises Institute? What brought you to uh, anarcho-capitalism? Okay, sure. Thanks for having me, Greg. And, and yes, this has been a while in coming. <laughs> it's largely my fault. So I appreciate your persistence and patience. Um, I let's so in junior high, I, I was really into physics. I loved Richard Feynman, and I thought I was going to grow up and be a physicist. And then um, my dad subscribed to a, this political uh, journal. It was like a collection of the weekly articles in the newspaper from around the newspapers from around the country. It was called the Conservative Chronicle. So, like in terms of U.S. politics, they were the conservatives. Which, for international listeners, that you know, it, it actually some in some respects dovetails with classical liberalism. But they were definitely skeptical of government intervention into the economy. And then of those writers, though, it was the economist Thomas Sowell and Walter Williams that I liked the most. And so then that's I, I started realizing, like, oh wow, I really like economics now. Um, I got my hands on. Henry Hazlitt's Economics in One Lesson. In the beginning of that, he, he, I think he dedicated the book to Ludwig von Mises. So the, who's this guy? I got his book, Human Action, when I was a senior in high school. So I did read it for people, you know, it's a, it's a thick book. I'm not saying I understood it all, but I did read it in high school. And, I, and so at that point, not only did I know I wanted to go into economics, but I said, oh, I want to go in the Austrian school in particular. And then I just started getting stuff by Murray Rothbard and that really was the icing on the cake. Um, I, at this point, I still called myself a minarchist. I still thought that, you know, the state needed to provide basic law and order, military defense, stuff like that. And then um, I was aware, so, you know, Rothbard was, of course, a famous anarcho-capitalist writer. And I was aware of the fact that he um, believed that the government, or sorry, that the, the market could provide those basic functions. And I, I just didn't. I don't remember exactly if it was just, I just thought, well, that, that's not going to work or that seems like such a huge leap, but I'm not sure. But by the time I got into college, undergraduate level, I finally was ready to, I, I think a big part was too, I had gone, I might be mixing up events here, but a bit, I know a big thing in terms of reassuring me was, it was the fact that my history was faulty, that, um, you know, I, I kind of had grown up in the United States in particular, this gets drilled into you that, uh, oh, wow, the, the Allies sat back and did nothing while Germany was rampaging and, you know, in the, in the 1930s. And But thank goodness the strong U.S. military came in and saved the world from the Nazis and, you know, that kind of thing. And so it seemed like, oh, wow, if, you've, if you had a Rothbardian vision, then that means the Nazis would be running the world. I remember Ralph Rako's historical lectures kind of made me think, wait a minute, that maybe that's a little bit cartoonish and, and the world's more complicated than that. So various strands but that's and then the mises institute i i went there i think in 1999 was my first year down there and then um i was a, i was a grad student at nyu at the time getting my phd in economics and then i just started spending uh like 20 summers in a row like that like both as a grad student and then when i became a professor uh, teaching at their mises u oh that's cool by the way i was also a grad student at nyu so uh Oh, you were? Yeah. Okay. I went to Quran for mathematics, actually. Oh, I, I went to, I mean, I was across the street at the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences, but I did, I signed up for a class like on mathematical finance or something at Quran, but then I got a job offer 
and moved away. Like I went to like one or two sessions before, but I, so we moved away from New York, but yeah. Yeah. And NYU has some famous schools like Stern for economics. And I imagine economics dovetails now a lot with uh, the libertarian and anarcho-capitalist vision, especially. Um, so this is cool. And it's interesting that you mentioned like undergrad is when it finally gelled for you, which means you were thinking about this back in high school times, maybe even junior high. Like how, you know. Yeah, yeah, I definitely got into political philosophy and economics in high school. Like, like I said, by the time I was a senior in high school, I knew for my career, I wanted to go get a PhD in economics and be a college professor. That's awesome. Okay. And then you have a book out. I'm here uh, showing the audience. So uh, Understanding Money Mechanics. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, you know, how did you come to write it? And what is it about? Sure. So it is a, uh, so it's, for, it's, you know, the Mises Institute published it and they pushed me, uh, you know, Jeff Dice was the president at the time and, and he kind of commissioned me to do this. And it's, um, it, 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 as the title suggests, it's a, it's an introduction or primer, if you want to call it that in terms of, uh, you know, how, do, how does money and banking work, but it's, it's, it has a, a U.S. focus, but it would be relevant to, you know, any reader from around the world. But it, it, it focuses on the U.S. and starts with just like, why do we have, what is money? Why do we have it? What's banking? Why do we have it? And then it gives some of the history about where, where money came from. You know, in the U.S., it, the dollar used to be defined in terms of gold and silver. And then just it tells some of the history of that and then just shows how central banking works. But it, it also gets into some modern controversies, as you may be aware, Greg, that there's been a big push in the last several years of, of people saying, hey, the way the way the economics textbooks teach money and banking is backwards. It's, you know, the banks create deposits by making loans to people. And it's, you know, it's not like the central bank is, is regulating things. So anyway, we, I just, in some of the later chapters, I touch on issues like that just to try to referee those debates. Yeah, that's awesome. I think a big part of this discussion will be about banking and how, how our money originates and how our money, uh, the sources and the sinks of the money, if you will, as well as the, uh, the fiscal and monetary policies of the entities that are empowered to issue money. Many people don't understand, but actually most of our money supply comes from banks today in the form of credit card, consumer credit, mm -hmm. or lend lending to businesses. You know, a lot of the times when a transaction happens and it gets paid for, it gets paid for by credit money, uh, which is essentially some underwriter at a bank had previously authorized this amount of credit. Um, so I, I love to talk about that because uh, let me just give a little bit of a background on myself, right? Um, I came to similar conclusions in terms of authoritarianism versus libertarianism on that axis. On the left, right axis, I, I tend to lean more towards redistribution of money. And I, I, I'm a, almost like a social conservative. And I, I believe that in order to, for people to stay at home with their kids or raise their kids or whatever, uh, they need to have a safety net or even a universal basic income. Uh, in order to to do that, to spend time with their parents, because, you know, instead of working for 10 hours a day uh, for corporations, uh, they might have a choice. Uh, mm -hmm. Liberty may, might mean to me the, the real choice between, you know, without having to starve, you know, different things you can do in life, uh, take up a hobby, religion, etc. So we have a little bit different on the left and right, but I, I find it very interesting to talk to other libertarians because we agree so much on so many things, including, by the way, the connection between money and war, financing war, mm -hmm. the Nazis. And I wanted to say that, you know, a lot of times um, they, they come into the middle of the story, you know, when the war is happening or right. the atrocities are happening. And they say, well, we need big government to counter big government, you know. But the thing is, if you look at almost every case, including the Nazis, there was a big government thing before that sort of uh, helped to give rise to the thing. Right. So, for example, with uh, um, Osama bin Laden, OK, mm -hmm. uh, attacking the United States. Well, Osama bin Laden was funded a lot by the CIA and by um, the Saudis uh, during the Afghan war when when it was the USSR that was uh, in Afghanistan. And then we helped to fund the Mujahideen and we gave money to groups like Osama's or with the Nazis, with the, the French having the. Uh, the Treaty of Versailles, where they made the Germans uh, pay reparations in gold and they didn't have enough money and, and like the value, like Deutsche Mark was completely destroyed. And so people were looking for someone else, some other group. And it happened to be the Nazis. And then, of course, they took over the whole government. 
But at the time, there were communists and there were Nazis and there were others vying for power in a Weimar Republic that <clears throat> was essentially going bankrupt or, or was bankrupt because of these uh, reparations the governments put on each other. So I guess what I'm saying is, had there been no reparations, had there been no CIA, maybe there would not have been an Osama bin Laden or the Nazis in the first place. So, yeah, right. Yeah, I appreciate that. And I agree with you. And it's the, the way I put it, like the real quick version of U.S. history. Again, I'm, as you know, people in, in the United States raised here could tend to be very U.S. centric uh, in their views. But yeah, right. It's, it, you know, they say, oh, the U.S. are minding its own business. And then they had to go into World War One to make the world safe for democracy. And then the Nazis just came up out of nowhere. And so then they had to go back. And then the Soviet Union was this evil dictatorship that was trying to take over the world. So we had to fight. And not, you know, whereas you could plausibly make a case that if the U.S. had not gone into World War I, there would have been more of a stalemate and a negotiated settlement. And the terms, like you say, wouldn't have been so harsh against Germany. And so maybe, we, you know, Hitler never would have, we wouldn't even know who to, what his name was if the U.S. had never gone to World War I. And then likewise, you say, okay, but still the U.S. going and then the U.S. is allied with, you know, FDR and Stalin and Churchill are all buddies and, you know, given half of Europe over to the Soviet Union. And then, oh, now the Soviet Union is the bad guy. We got to fight them. And then, like you say, then that kind of spawned all sorts of things in different areas too. And, oh, and all these rebel groups or, you know, what's what's going on in, uh, you know, Cambodia and so forth. And so it, when you see like U.S. foreign policy, and what what's funny to me is how U.S. conservatives can totally understand how, oh, it's immoral and just causes more of the problems when the U.S., government intervene domestically in economic affairs like oh we're going to try to help poor people and then you set up a program that keeps them you know in generations of poverty and u.s conservatives you know republicans are very good at understanding that but then when you say oh maybe that same group of government officials if you give them missiles and you know aircraft and tanks they can't make the world you know a nice democratic region and maybe you're causing more problems than you're solving. You know, to them, that's anathema and, you know, a treasonous statement. How dare you question the integrity of our, you know, so. Well, that's anyway. It, yeah. it's, Every single bloody conflict, especially the civil wars, which are typically the most bloody, like mm -hmm. in the United States, the most bloody conflict was the civil war. And in mm -hmm. fact, we started the greenback to finance our part of, you know, to finance uh, the war because we had to, by we, I mean our government. And sure. you know, so, so you look at all these revolutions. The French Revolution had a counter revolution. The Russian Revolution, which led to the USSR, had a counter revolution, which I, I'm showing here on the screen. Um, you know, counter revolutions lead to civil wars. Uh, and typically, these other powers that are outside of the country start to take sides, you know, and it becomes also a proxy war between these sides. Um, Russia is, Russia is very big, but like in Yemen, you have the Sunnis versus the Shiites, you know, the Houthi rebels sponsored by Iran to some extent. And you have the blockade by, by the Saudis and coalition. Or in Ukraine, where you had the Maidan revolution and then you had the anti-Maidan revolution, or at least counter, you know, revolution. And it, it seems to me that a lot of the times, many of these, many of these regions, including maybe Israel and Palestinians, are remnants of a proxy war between two great powers, you know, mm -hmm. it's almost like it's not just the small governments, it's also the large imperialist governments that come in and simply mess up the region by essentially pro each side promises you're going to win. Here's some weapons and go, you know, go do your right thing. And I, I think that is very, uh, that is very destructive as well. Yeah, yeah, I, I totally agree. And, and again, like you, you know, with a lot of these places, it's the, at least the way it's taught in, you know, U S history. It's just the U S government just minding its own business. And we just, we're free and we, you know, we love our freedom. And then all of a sudden in this other region, this crazy, you know, the bloodthirsty killers break out and the U S government reluctantly has to go in and, you know, yeah. pull the, pull the fighting parties apart and say, Hey, you stop that now and I'll be civilized. When, like you're saying, you can kind of look and say, well, no, actually the CIA killed their, their leader 20 years ago and then installed some puppet. And maybe that's partly why they have an anti-capitalist bias over there. And they don't trust the U.S. government, you know, stuff like that. Exactly. Um, I, I want to show you two things to the readers really quickly. Um, one is uh, you see these military takeovers uh, on the rise in Africa, they say. Mm -hmm. um, well, it turns out, and that now is the sixth uh, coup. If you look at um, 
uh, a lot of the times there's actually articles by our own media that basically says um, that the U.S. is uh, sort of responsible because as well. But keep in mind, the Russians also are sending the uh, their paramilitary groups, uh, this, this uh, Prigozhin group. What, what are they called? The, the Wagner group. OK. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And like it's again, proxy wars in Africa. No one really talks about it because I would say uh, kind of. Uh, looking at this, it seems that Europeans are more important. European lives are more important than, you know, uh, maybe it's because they're white Christians or maybe because Europe is close to the United States or whatever. But no one talks about the African um, coups as much as they talk about Ukraine or any of the other things. But yes, there are seven countries now that, that had a, a coup just in the last three years. And of course, there's Yemen as well. And I, I, here, I wanted to play this. Check this out. This clip here kind of shows what it looks like. U.S. National Security Advisor Brzezinski flew to Pakistan to set about rallying resistance. He wanted to arm the Mujahideen without revealing America's role. On the Afghan border near the Khyber Pass, he urged the soldiers of God to redouble their efforts. We know of their deep belief in God, and we are confident that their struggle will succeed. That land over there is yours. You'll go back to it one day because your fight will prevail and you'll have your homes and your mosques back again because your cause is right and God is on your side. The purpose of coordinating with the Pakistanis will be to make the Soviets bleed for as much and as long. Yeah, basically, it uh, seems to be this is to me, this is like the most naked statement. Brzezinski was mm -hmm. shamelessly admitting, you know, that uh, let me let me turn the next one up. So Brzezinski is basically saying, hey, we're arming these proxy groups, you know, these uh, also called Afghan Arabs, which were people didn't live in Pakistan, but uh, came to Pakistan, right, to fight. Uh, and, and the purpose is stated right there. It's to stick it to those other guys. This, uh, mm -hmm. the Soviets in this case. Uh, but of course, that's where Osama bin Laden's funding came from later on. And all of this stuff may have been avoided. Um, all of the war on terror and all of this stuff that later ravaged the Middle East uh, started here uh, to, to a large extent. So, yeah. yeah. And in, in more modern times, like there's crazy examples, like in Syria, was it the CIA and the Department of Defense were both funding opposite sides of the conflict at one point, just because they, you know, they each operation had their own strategic interests. And, you know, so it, yeah, I mean, when you're a little kid growing up, you had this idea that, oh, you know, our government wouldn't deal with bad guys. And when you, and then you realize, oh, no, they, they work with, they often give them the guns and the money to go do, you know, because it's deemed in, in that narrow term in U.S. interests, you know, to support that particular faction in some conflict somewhere. Okay, so we agree basically on governments and war. Uh, I think to a large extent. Let's talk about how we can organize society in the absence of government. Okay. Um, first, I would like to say that uh, since I will be, I, I thought it would be a nice format for me to represent the left, sort of. Sure. Okay. Um, and so one charge is always leveled before we get to a, a absence of government. One charge is often leveled against, uh, say, socialism. Okay. Is that socialism has killed. You, you pick the number, right? 100 million people or whatever you can add up. I mean, you could be dishonest a little bit about it and say, well, if the Nazis were socialists because it's in their name and the communists were socialists, then they were killing each other in a war. So therefore, so therefore add up all the deaths in that war and that socialism killed, you know, another 60 mm -hmm. million people. Some people do that. Uh, I don't think that's what they mean when they say socialism is killed. I think they're referring more to like this thing, uh, for example, um, the Holodomor in Ukraine, uh, or for example, the three uh, years in China uh, with uh, like the famine years right. right now. And so, you know, some people even go as far as to call it a genocide because, you know, in the case of the Holodomor, uh, there were people, uh, it was mostly Ukrainian nationalists uh, or Ukrainians, okay? And when I say nationalists, because they wanted to have their own state, their own country back then also, and they briefly did. Uh, but they, they felt maybe it was Stalin uh, specifically targeting that region um, for um, 
what's it called um for uh retribution but actually if you look further like there were famines under when there was the uh the war uh the communists had taken over and there was a, a counter-revolution and this civil war there was a famine all throughout the volga region which was ethnic russians like in russia so it's unlikely that they would be deciding to genocide their own people um mm -hmm. and so it seems to me that a lot of this has to do also with governments uh and war and what i want to bring up is this for every one of these socialist um, famines, okay, there was also an explicitly capitalist famine. So, for example, the Irish potato famine. Uh, in um, when I read about it, and the Irish potato famine um, had taken place, you know, in Ireland, uh, but a lot of it, again, there's a disaster. But how do we deal with the disaster is the issue, and so the potato crop failed. But then, a lot of it had to do with the property uh, rights of landlords versus the, mm -hmm. the the peasants and the peasants would have done a lot better had the property rights not been put uh over and above human lives you know um it was ex back then uh the tories i think it was or i forgot which party explicitly pushed laissez-faire um um laissez-faire um policies okay and they were the Whig administration they were uh, they were influenced by this idea that let the markets operate and well, there was a famine of about 15 million, 15% of the country perished. Many people emigrated. That was the time when people were leaving Ireland. The other one I want to show is the Bengal famine, which was after Holodomor. It was 1943. And it was exacerbated by Winston Churchill, okay? Although he was here mm -hmm. in World War II, uh, he's largely blamed for requisitioning grain and, and sending it out of the country at a time when people really needed it uh, and sending it to the, the British. And of course, the Britain has a long history in India with the British Raj and before that with the East India Company, right? They come with their state capitalism, right? And they be, and they do this, the United States did this in Bolivia with the United Fruit Company. The British did this in Iran with the uh, British Petroleum, where they also like take over the government or, or AstroTurf revolution to take it over. But in India, what they did is they came and they basically set up the East India Company. They took, took over India. Uh, the first company kind of took over it economically, but then, uh, you know, India has a, has a long history as an empire. They uh, they had empires there, like the Gupta Empire, United India. But at this time, the British were able to, I don't know whether with using gunpowder or whatever, were able to take over and install governors locally, just like they did in uh, the Americas and, and now where are the people, right? They, they were driven into reservations and so on. My point is, that for every, you know, to say that communism or socialism killed so many people, I would argue that, you know, Native Americans lived under a sort of communist communes, you know, catching fish, sharing and all that stuff. And then came people who thought you can own land, own all these things and drove them out. And the same in India. And, and so famines happen under both economic systems. It looks like it's more like government force that is causing, uh, an idea, maybe property rights, maybe uh, collectivizing farms over people's lives. They see people dying, but they're like, hey, this thing is more important. One day, this thing is going to feed more people. So these guys die. But then eventually this ideology will uh, will be good for, for everybody. That's, to me, the, the problem, not the economic system as much as the government force. What would you say uh, to that? OK, sure. Um, so one. Uh thing I would say just is your sort of a side note is there you were kind of saying like we, we both agree we want to get rid of governments or whatever in recent years I've I try to be more specific and just say I don't like the political state like I think you know, I might even use the capital s because some people use government more loosely like they could say there's government in the family or in the church so you know so if, if that's what someone means by government with a small g just that you know there's certain hierarchies just perhaps socially then I'm not against that per se. So, you know, it's, I, I get what you mean. Like when people say, oh, the government's out to get us or something that, yeah, that, that's what we mean that what you and I are talking about. But anyway, I just want to make that clarification. Um, Good. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. So for this one, and, and you're right when um, like there's the black book of communism and that goes and lists, you know, and it tries to tally up a bunch of deaths and you're right there. They specifically, what they mean is not people, not soldiers dying in war or not even, uh, you know, collateral damage in cities when some 
you know, the country drops a bomb on somebody else's cities and then some innocent people die. They're not even talking about that. Yeah, they mean like governments enacting policies that end up killing their own people. OK, so um, and that's the sense in which, you know, it, so I agree with you. There's ways you can inflate the numbers. But there, again, with fairly conservative estimates, it's that Stalin and Mao killed many millions of people each, you know, of their own people, not in, in wartime. Um, so, you know, have, with, with that stipulation or whatever, um, I, I, I wouldn't. If you're trying to say like, hey, it's socialism versus capitalism, who's got a better track record? I wouldn't say the Bengal famine can fairly be laid at the feet of capitalism because you said, for one thing, that's in the middle of World War II. And we all agree that Winston Churchill's decisions had a lot to do with it that were driven partly by the war effort, and partly by, you know, his personal racism. Like, I guess that his diaries, he, you know, he wrote some pretty nasty stuff. So we don't have to speculate. Um, but I, I would, you know, you you can call that what you want, but like I don't think that's it's fair to call that capitalism. The, the Irish famine, I think you're probably there. I unfortunately I don't know enough about that, even though my name is Murphy and I think some of my great grandparents came from Ireland. Um, I don't know enough about that, but yeah, I'm open. If you just want to say yeah, that's an example of, come on, it was property rights. I, I guess the only thing I would ask is, from your description, you made it sound like there's a bunch of landowners who are sitting there eating all these potatoes and getting fat. And then there's all these people who had been able to go to the market and buy potatoes, you know, two years earlier, and now they couldn't. And to me, that doesn't, you know, make make sense. Like what? Even well, the landowners who had the potatoes, wouldn't they still want to sell them to the people and just sell them at a higher price? Yeah, well, it's obviously more complicated than that. Uh, let's mm -hmm. read on Wikipedia. But when we start the story, the peasants are already peasants, right? They're already like subsistence farmers, barely. Uh, surviving or crop, you know, sharecroppers or whatever the systems were. I mean, here in the United States, we had slavery, right, mm -hmm. which was for for the cotton uh, industry and others uh, at the time uh, was very lucrative. I'm also you could ask, like, why why have slaves? Why not have just the money circulate and give the people money, then they go buy something, you know, have a choice of housing, right? But that's not uh, the system back then. And I understand there was feudalism, you know, for hundreds of years, so people were experimenting. <laughs> Uh, but but look at what it says here about the system. During the 18th century, the middleman system for managing landed property was introduced. Rent collection was left in the hands of landlord agents or middlemen. This assured the landlord of a regular income, right? That's quintessential capitalism, and relieved them of direct responsibility. So they're uh, absentee landlords in a way, uh, while leaving tenants open to exploitation by the middleman. Uh, the Catholics, the majority of whom lived in conditions of poverty and security, made up 80% of the population. Um, at the top of the social pyramid was the ascendancy class, people who, you know, hobnob with the English and so on. Um, many of these absentee landlords lived in England. The rent revenue collected from these impoverished tenants who were paid minimal wages to raise crops and livestock for export was mostly sent to England. So again, things are being sent out, uh, the money and sometimes the food. And so this is what um, in 1845 uh, they were reported. It would be impossible adequately to describe the privations for which the Irish laborer and his family habitually and silently endure. In many districts, their only food is the potato. So this is like the Martian, <laughs> the guy, if you ever seen that movie, he has only potatoes, but that's because he's on another planet um, and it's a movie. Their only beverage, water, their cabins are seldom a protection against the weather. A better blanket is a rare luxury and nearly in all, uh, all of their pig and manure heap constitute their entire property. Um, it goes on to basically talk about the middleman as being one of the worst you know, type of person ever is like the tax collector in Roman times or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's basically, it's a system where, again, like Romans had slaves, they had tax collectors, right? And it was pretty oppressive for those people. But this is the, in the 18th century. You could expect people to be richer than the Roman Empire on average. So the wealth wasn't being redistributed. I guess that's my point is like the system was being perpetuated kind of like today with the Amazon uh, sweatshops until they got the robots, they had the, the, Amazon makes it very nice for the consumer, right? It drives prices down for the consumer. Mm. No one's got to work in the warehouses. So this is, but today we have so many protections that, you know, we have bankruptcy protection, which instead of debtor's pr prisons, you know, we have all these things now. So at least it's better. But I'm saying like, we have capitalism today. You can see it today. And I'm not sure that's exactly the better system for everybody because these people aren't exactly uh, socially, uh, economically mobile. The, you know, work in an Amazon warehouse, Every day that you work in it is a day you're economically wasting that you could have done 
potentially something in a different system. Anyway, that's my uh, that's my feeling anyway. OK, sure. So um, I certainly don't want to just try to like use definitions and like any bad thing that you show me, I'm going to say, well, that's not real capitalism. I'm not for that. Right. Because then, you know, I, I get frustrated with communists who would say, well, what Stalin did, I, you know, yeah, you shouldn't go kill millions of people. Duh. You know, let's get a communist rule. You, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, every like, side happens, says, we, sorry to interrupt. Just want to say yeah. communists always said we haven't built communism yet. Wait for it. Right. But mm -hmm. then anarcho capitalists also say we don't really live, live in a true, it's I say fair thing. There's the, yeah, but both sides have no uh, hundred percent pure example that they could point to in the world and say, look, it's working. So, yeah, I completely agree that there's no pure example of it. But, yeah. So I but I guess I, what I would say, though, is like even on your own terms, like here, let's stipulate that. OK, yeah, the Irish. Fa I, obviously, I could go in and say, oh, no, but the fact that the crown was involved and blah, 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 blah. That's not true. Laissez faire. But still, you know, if you're good, like you said, for the, what we just said, the reasons you're going to associate something with capitalism or whatever. Certainly the British Empire was more capitalism than it was socialism. And in the grand sweep of things. And so if I want to be able to point at Stalin and Mao and say, that's communism for you, then, you know, surely someone on the other side of the debate should be able to point to stuff that happened under the British empire. I get it. Um, but even there, like, again, a, a famine that happened in the 1840s compared to, we're talking 20th century mass famines. You know what I mean? There, so there is a difference that under capitalist systems, I don't believe in the 20th century outside of wartime, there were mass famines, um, you know, and maybe there were, but in terms of certainly body count, I, I don't think it's even close. And, but, and anyway, I guess though, I think two of the strongest examples would be um, North and South Korea. Right. Right. And then East and West Germany that again, there's, there's not nothing like a literally controlled experiment in the social sciences, but there, you know, that's pretty decent that it was the same kind of population. And then it was somewhat arbitrary divisions and, it's in terms of the outcomes, it's certainly not close in terms of who has a higher GDP per capita, North or South Korea, or any, you know, in the midst well, of the Cold War. I agree. But and, and again, I think you're right that Germany would be a better example because at least Germany, uh, you know, on the one hand, you had uh, wealth uh, taking over West Germany, and on the other hand, you have wealth taking over East Germany. Although that wealth is a little disputable because it had just suffered a loss of 30 million people. I'm talking about the Soviet Union, and obviously the economy was much worse. But having said all that, yes, I would agree that West Germany fared better than East Germany. However, uh, take something like North Korea or Cuba or something like that. I mean, mm -hmm. there's a chance that also somebody would say that these governments are rigging the, the game and they're spe specifically putting massive sanctions on imports, exports like, oh, you guys are communist. Well, you don't get to trade with the rest of the world. <laughs> yeah, or, yeah, fair enough. Um, yeah, so so uh, incidentally, that's a reason that uh, another reason that I am against the U.S. government putting embargoes on. Like I understand not you know putting in uh, sanctions on trading weapons, materials, and stuff. I get that, but in general, yeah, there's some government somewhere the U.S. doesn't like, and let's not let food get into those people. To me, that's both immoral but also counter. Because then, yeah, if if that regime really is screwed up, the the ruler can just blame everything on the U.S. you know embargo. Right? Yeah, and the other way, if the regime, if the economic system is so bad, why don't we let them fail on an equal playing field, right? Let them fail, right. and maybe it doesn't fail. Maybe it just achieves a lower growth rate. So that should be fine. I think people should be able to choose. Now, don't get me wrong; they're they're using the apparatus of the government to coerce other people, but so are. The capitalists, and I'm going to go through it, but capitalism uses the government also uh, to enforce property rights. You know, every time a landlord evicts a person for non-payment, mm -hmm. right? If they own 10,000 houses mm -hmm. uh, and uh, this person happens to be squatting. Now, there are protections called adverse possession where you move in and the landlord doesn't notice for 10 years. OK, now you have protections. But if you move in and it was nine years, right, and, and you and your family are getting shelter in Detroit, in an abandoned house or whatever. And then this management company says and evicts you. All these evictions and all of these things also are done at the point of a gun with the same hyperbole that right, right. is mm -hmm. used for tax collection. So whether it's collecting taxes and redistributing for public goods or public services, or whether it's 
more decentralized, but individual enforcement of uh, property rights, right? Like Trump, Trump put a moratorium on evictions, right? And I would argue that millions of people who are now not insecure, their brain is not occupied with like, how do I downsize and move out of my family into like a smaller home or maybe into a trailer or maybe become homeless. Like these people are more productive and maybe better at work and they can focus better. And even we have studies showing that IQ is related to poverty, right? So I want to say that there have been studies in the last 10 years that show that effective IQ is correlated to poverty. And so if you actually uh, decrease poverty, all right, we're back. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so this was uh, essentially still, we're working on this uh, open source software and when it's done, I hope that it'll be better than Zoom and others. Mm -hmm. So let's continue with, with where we left off. Um, sure. Well, all right. Um, what were we talking about? I well, let me, can I say something to kind of frame? Sure, please. It's a suggestion and then, yeah. So, um, you know, we're talking, we're trying to evaluate the merits of certainly like the, the easiest thing for me would be to say capitalism is better than communism for the average person which to trick your debate is capitalism versus socialism, you know, because all the horrible regimes are also happen to be communist. They're not merely socialist. So, you know, that, so, um, and then, you know, we, we were talking examples of like the U S government embargoing Cuba or, you know, North Korea or things like that. So my suggestion though would be, if you really want to isolate, because there it's not even that the U S government says, Oh, we own all of, Cuba. that's why we have the legal right to not let people trade with it because that's our property. You know, they don't even say that. So it's not like they're even making a pretense that this is pure laissez-faire capitalism. We're just neutrally enforcing property rights there. They're kind of saying, well, this Trump's property. In fact, you know, it's U S property owners who say, Oh, I would like to export, right. You know, wheat to Cuba and the U S government saying, no, you're not allowed to do that. violating your property. Right. Right. So I, it, you know, if, if somebody on the left wants to argue, Oh, come on, what we mean by capitalism that's fine but then in that case i would say i'm not a supporter of capitalism right so that's kind of how that would play so i think you know what is more interesting and really gets to the essence of perhaps the difference in our worldview is like clear-cut enforcement of property rights that yeah a landlord owns all this land there's poor starving people who are like sneaking over the fence to take apples off the tree and he pulls out his, his men come out with shotguns and say get off like that's the kind of so is that okay to try to focus it like that? Yeah, let's focus. Now let's pretend there's no government, okay? Mm -hmm. And uh, someone's got to enforce the property rights. So let's say there's due process. And let's say there are courts, okay? But at the end of the day, the enforcement of property rights is also force. It's right there in the name, enforcement. Mm -hmm. so, so that means it's still an institution. And we could still question, you know, it's a man-made institution. It's not like property rights are inherent in nature. It's not like a lion can own... 10,000 plots of land, you know, and so we create this system where the, the banks, you know, hold on to your deed and maybe there's hereditary uh, accumulation of wealth, whatever, you know, and immigrants don't have as much. They become indentured servants. And so I would say that it might be useful in that system to lessen the guarantees to the property owner and balance them with the interests of the person. So adverse possession bankruptcy protection instead of debtors prisons okay in other words yeah let's say bankruptcy protection in the past if someone owed a bunch of money they couldn't pay it they go to jail like how is that economically productive right this person would be much better off participating in the market and maybe having their slate wiped clean but then what that would mean is that um there's limited liability and that would mean that people now have to worry about well maybe if i give this person some credit they won't be able to pay it back, but that's a more humane system, I think. And that's the one most civilized countries have today. Whereas in the past they had debtors prisons because of the, well, that's, that's the moral thing to do is, well, the guy is negative. So put him in jail, you know, show him who's boss. Uh, I think that system may, may not be as economically productive even. And the last thing I want to say is like the moratorium on evictions. Um, if you have 10,000, I'll, I'll come out and say this. I think that the application of force should have a diminishing return. So if you have 10,000 houses as one entity, and uh, I think the court should simply decline to use force on your behalf on the 
past a certain number of houses, it will just use proportionally less force. Where the point is then you won't be able to enforce that amount of ownership. And uh, society would naturally taper off on the amount. Like John Locke said, you know, he had the Lockean proviso, right? He said that, uh, yes, you could do homesteading, you could get the crops. But if you get too much, the, the crops are just rotting in the field, then you're misusing God's gifts, right? You're misusing the earth and you should let someone else to have that property. And I think that's the spirit. And even John Locke, the libertarians used to... Uh, to ground their uh, homesteading ideas of where property originates. Even he said, well, yes, but uh, there's a limit. Uh, you know, you can't just uh, you can't just have an unlimited property right. And I think today, anarcho-capitalists forget that and they, they support an unlimited property right that then you need a large government to enforce. And I think that's a problem. What do you think? Okay, yeah, so lots of different points in there. Um, yeah, so yeah, if you want to even refine our discussion even more and say not we don't even mean the moderns that are sort of night watchmen enforcing just basic property right if you want to even get rid of that apparatus and say yeah like a, a rothbardian you know ideal society that any an standard anarcho-capitalist in that tradition would point to and say yep that's a that's a voluntary society they might even use that that term and then you're going to say what are you talking about there's you know guys with guns show up all the time in such a world and so we talk and and it really just boils down to the definition of the legitimacy of the rights involved. Just like in our society today, normal people, if someone doesn't pay their taxes and then the police ultimately, you know, the, the bank puts a lien on their stuff or whatever, you know, on behalf of the IRS. And then ultimately it could come down to men with guns showing up and women too, showing up and taking them and throwing them in a cage because, hey, you didn't pay your taxes. And so we got to make an example of you. Obviously, standard libertarian anarcho-capitalists are going to freak out and say, oh, look at this coercion. But you're right. They don't have a problem if there's an analogous situation where, yeah, some uh, squatter is this in, 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 a, in a even a shack that he built on someone else's property because some court says so. Look at the title. And then people with guns from the you know Rothbardian defense agency show up and they grab the person and throw them in a cage. So, um, so one thing is, I don't know if you were aware of this, but I'm actually a pacifist. Okay. So in a lot of my writings that, yeah, so I still believe in property rights and you can call it law enforcement. To me, the ideal system would be something like this, where if there's a dispute, people take it to a judge and the judge issues a ruling and says, oh yeah, I think, you know, the, the defendant did steal that television set from the plaintiff. And my, in my opinion, uh, the defendant owes whatever two ounces of gold, both for compensation and punitive damages to the thing. And then the community just knows that again, it would have to be a reputable judge and you know, that kind of stuff. And that's just known. And then maybe in the, and the enforcement mechanism would be more like shunning. Mm -hmm. It's like maybe a lot of the local merchants would say, no, no, you have this pending, you owe that person two ounces of gold and we know you have it, you know, cause they would have to, and if you're just, if you're saying, you know, I'm not paying it cause I didn't steal that TV. Well, then we're not doing business with you. Like we can. So to me, that's pretty clear. Like that's certainly if, if property rights exist at all, then that's certainly you're not you're certainly violating someone's rights by just saying don't come onto my land. And I think that that would be a lot of you know just and, and yeah, it wouldn't be a perfect system. You could come up with crazy examples where someone's getting screwed, but I think that's going to happen in any sense. But there, I think you know. So it's not that there even is a group that comes and you know grabs you and. It would just be the, the the bare minimum would be you would need like a company you might call it. Hey, someone's out trespassing on my land and I want them off. And even there, I would think they would not have guns. They would like have body armor and nuts and stuff. And to me, and, and I'm not just saying like a utopian, I think in standard market forces, that would be the, the long run outcome. Yeah, I actually, I actually but, believe yeah. that. I'm not against markets. I think neighborhoods mm -hmm. should... Uh, have contracts with police agencies, like all these wars about which flag is going to fly over which uh, region, like Crimea mm -hmm. or whatever. It, it, funny enough, when the government gets big enough, there's a federation. Uh, when Crimea moves from uh, the Russian uh, SSR to the Ukrainian SSR, which it did, people didn't fight over it. They didn't have a nationalist feeling because they felt they were all part of this big federation. And so it was considered an administrative change. So no guns, no shootings. People just change the, the the signs on the roads, you know, all these things. But I would take it further and, and say, if there was no governments, uh, why do you need to bundle all these services, the roads, the electricity, the mm -hmm. all these things, the water? Um, 
I think the neighborhoods should uh, vote on in a market, right? Of like, okay, as a neighborhood, as a community, right, right. They, mm -hmm. Because it doesn't work on an individual level. There's a there's a thing in uh, Gangs of New York where uh, the firefighters are setting fire to the other uh, things in order to sabotage the other firefighters. Um, so you do need some level of cooperation rather than competition. But uh, a neighborhood renewing a contract of a police agency because they don't have guns and they have better policing and they know the people. I think that's good. Yeah. So like, it's not like I'm against markets. I just think that markets aren't like the be all and end all, like the hammer for every nail. I just think right. that, uh, yeah, we use them where we want consumer choice. And uh, but we also need to be mindful of people's rights to like housing, water, like basic things. And we can't just privatize them like, well, you can't have any more water because it says right here, you know, this is your, you know what I mean? You know, like there has to be a balance between property rights and other rights, I guess. is, is. Okay. So, so yeah, I'm glad that we, we actually agree on a lot and now we're like, it keeps shrinking and where we're focusing on areas where maybe we don't disagree. So I think this is useful. Um, so I, I would put it this way. I agree there are considerations beyond mere property rights to, to know like what is the right thing to do in a situation. So I'm Christian. So certainly I would think, hey, if I'm a rich guy and I'm walking down the street and I see a bunch of homeless people and I especially if I think, you know, they really have something medically wrong. with It's not just, you know, some 25 year old guy who doesn't feel like getting a job or something. Um, then then, yes, I think you have a Christian duty to at the very least provide the bare minimum and then even in terms of your you know what are you doing with your life like making sure are there organizations out there that you know try to help these people put you know give them a place to sleep and you know get them job skills or drug you know rehab or whatever if that's what they need and so forth and you should support those things so i agree with all that i guess the where maybe you and i would differ though is i would say all of that would be embedded in a property rights framework and it should be voluntary that it can't just be that 60% of the community votes and says, Hey, those rich guys over there, I think you should be giving more. And they say, no, I think I give enough actually. And then they just say, well, we're taking it out of your bank account because you're too greedy. If, okay, if like, let's it's get into that. Yeah. I think that's mm -hmm. awesome. Uh, first of all, yes, we do agree. We both come from religious backgrounds. You know, I have a Jewish uh, background as well. I respect Christianity a lot as well. And, uh, I think that uh, a lot of my sense, so we both have the God of Abraham. Exactly. We have the same God. <laughs> And by the way, if uh, we're right, then everyone has the same guy. They just don't know it. Right. right, right. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, the thing is, look, um, it, the fact is that um, my sensibilities are informed by the Bible, right? It says take care mm -hmm. of the orphan and, the, you know, the widow. And it's the governments and the people in power who are often excoriated by these prophets, right? It's, it, it's the society itself. It's not mm -hmm. just, hey, you didn't give something. It's like your society's messed up itself, mm -hmm. right? Systemic. Mm -hmm. I think there have to be systems in place where, um, yes, we have to give individual charity. And I know people like Ben Shapiro say that putting in place social safety nets destroys individual charity. OK, but there's something to be said about social charity, like collective charity. Uh, and I don't mean charity because it's more dignity to have a universal basic income than it is to beg on the street and get somebody to help you. I'd rather give someone even like at this point, minimal housing minimal food, like all the Maslow's needs. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think that person will be more economically productive every day than if they are a window washer, uh, you know, a squeegee person uh, trying to, and that's, that's the productive guy. Like the unproductive guy is just begging, doing nothing. So right, right. I would rather invest in these people. And sure, maybe in some cases, the investment is not justified economically, like you lose money. But then there's people like JK Rowling, who was on welfare, Yang Kum, so J.K. Rowling started the Harry Potter franchise, billion, billions of dollars in jobs. Jan Kuhn started WhatsApp, sold it for $19 billion and so on. And, and, and people use it. The consumers of WhatsApp benefit. So we're going to have some losers in terms of like, you know, subsidizing them. But then there's going to be these huge winners, too. Um, we, we have no idea. So I would say just from a moral point of view, even if there were no winners, uh, it's nice to invest in your in your people, including your homeless and mentally challenged people you know yeah so again we we keep getting narrower and narrower in terms of where are we disagreeing here right so i like i said i i think it really the responsible thing to do especially you know if you're 
an upstanding member of the community and you know have a lot of affluence or whatever and you're worried about oh what are my investments doing and oh gee i only made you know 3.7 percent. i'm going to move my money to this fund next year if that's the kind of stuff you're doing and there's people literally starving to death in your city something's wrong um and and right and it's not just enough just to drive around and like start you know throwing snickers bars or something at, at people that really you want a more systematic process in place and, right and yeah and, and i but I, I do think and i'm not just like i you know i i worked in, in, when i was in chicago I, I went it was there was a period a couple of years ago where it got super cold like mm -hmm. the home would have died if they had to stay and so like our church you know has set up beds and whatever and i i didn't do it often but i you know i did, I did a couple of times and volunteered there and whatever and it was clear that yes it is good that we are doing this these people many of them would not survive the night it was just so bitter cold out and you know it's good that they came so certainly a society with the means should do something like that and then like you're saying well you know just extend that principle okay mm -hmm. so if we're going to say absolutely not we're not letting people just literally freeze to death overnight we're going to put you know and i don't care whether it's their fault and they made poor life choices exactly we're just not going to let that happen let them you know we don't want just you know you don't want to come out in the morning and you're, you go to take your kid to school and there's a dead person on the sidewalk that just that society <laughs> oh yeah failed. and secondly you know look I mean? we, we've yeah. abolished debtors prisons we have mm -hmm. uh, limited liability companies and i would argue that's good people can take risks whereas previously they would just not take a risk and you know being able to take risks mm -hmm. and entrepreneurship moves society forward so even from an economic point of view i think giving people safety nets actually improves the economy like i said the moratorium on evictions a society with a million uh, housing insecure people, in my opinion, is economically worse off because they have lower effective IQ. You know, they're taking the bus instead of taking a taxi. Uh, they're constantly looking around how to avoid homelessness. These people could maybe be a lot more productive if their mind was freed up and, you know, they were able to make better economic choices. So, like, there is something to be said for that. Um, if but, you can, want but can I ask you, though, I, I, where we might differ, though, is like i still would want everything to be voluntary in respecting whatever the existing distribution of property rights were so however those mm -hmm. local organizations that provide shelter and provide counseling services and job training what like i i would vastly prefer them to be funded you know through voluntary contributions oh but and also because of their efficacy like i think it's just hands and i'm not just speaking this and you know i know individuals who have seen both and i've seen both systems firsthand and i think those voluntary ones they're better able to tailor the need and they and it's not in their interest to have someone just become dependent on them like you well, know yes. ben shapiro is saying that if they have limited fund whereas if it's a government agency they they want the, the caseload to grow their budget next year to show look at all the people we're serving i'm not saying the individual worker is is cynical about it and, and strategic but i'm saying the organization as a whole it's actually not in its interest to you know have success cases it's just to keep them coming back so let's yeah and i think that's consequentialist and i like the milton friedman approach of consequentialism but mm -hmm. let me let me get into the nap and let me get into deontological sure. speak to the sure. deontological libertarian so for people who don't know deontological means that people uh care about the basic principles like an ayn rand type of thing where essentially even if the outcomes were better the other way they would say nope you have to never violate you know these these things so i want to speak directly to that the first thing is, you know, like I, I uh, had this response to uh, Chris Cantwell and others. And Chris Cantwell agreed, actually, with me right off the bat, back when he was at Free Talk Live. And I, had, I called in and he basically said, um, yeah, property is force. And most people should, most libertarians should start to acknowledge that. Well, if you're going to use force anyway, right, on behalf of what are you going to use it? 100% only property and not to do like a life-saving surgery for a guy in an emergency room? Okay, that's one approach, right? But the other approach is, I would say, taxation is not theft. What do I mean by that? Very clearly. There's a city of Boca Raton in Florida. Okay, It was built by a guy privately and then given over because he ran out of money to the citizens. And now it's run democratically. There's another city in Florida called Disney World. And it was uh, built by Walt Disney's corporation and is now owned by shareholders who don't live in Disney World. Okay, mm -hmm. So the ownership structure is... One is owned by the people who live there. The other is owned by people who don't live there. But they're both owned, okay? They're both run. So if um, if I am 
allowed and anarcho-capitalists totally agree that Disney World can charge me rent for um, for opening a, a business like a hot dog stand or whatever inside Disney World. And if I don't pay, then I get kicked out. And if I refuse to leave, then they can use men with guns to and women with guns to uh, evict me. Well, if that's true, I am claiming that taxation on the level of a city, not the federal government, whatever, but on the city level, is just like paying rent to the private city. It's like, okay, if I don't pay, like no one's forcing me to start a business in Boca serving the people of Boca. But if I do that, then the people of Boca say, well, some of that money will go to helping the homeless sweep the streets, you know, maintain infrastructure. And if, and that's, that's voluntary because if I don't want to, I just don't open a business in that uh, jurisdiction. So that's my uh, taxation in that form of a city charging you tax is like charging you rent. That, that's what I'm saying. It's not theft. Okay. Um, by the way, I got about 20 minutes. Okay. Uh, now I'm trying want... to pack it all in. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So my quick respect, I actually did a podcast episode on it because it's a fascinating topic. Specifically, I said, what if, like in the city, let's say you know the U.S. goes ANCAP, and then what about 30 years into that, some rich guy comes and buys up all the land in Philadelphia, what we now call Philadelphia, and just as like a museum or a theme park says, I'm going to recreate all the conditions back when there used to be governments in, in this region, and so I'm going to have the police, and they can pull you over and beat you up and stuff, and, and where and nothing happens to them, and and you know, and there's taxes because they used to have these things. And what if he just recreated? But it's all voluntary because he owns it. You know, he could do whatever he wants on his thing. And like what? And so my and I ended up thinking, well, um, if if he really did buy the you know the legal rights to do all those things, and it was well established, like people really did know. Like in other words, mm -hmm. you couldn't just walk into a restaurant and they give you a glass of water and you take one sip and they say, ah, oh, that'll be a billion dollars. Right. They have, you know what I mean? Like there's kind of norms where people, what have if they did do that? What if they did do that? Who would be the overseer of that? I would think, I would think, well, I think the, the patron wouldn't pay it. And then if the restaurant tried to take him to court, the judge would just say, no, that's so far out of the community norms and expectations. You had a duty to really publicize that and make sure you were getting true consent or uh, something like that. So that's what I am saying. Mm -hmm. uh, in my system, it's not that I'm using more force. I'm mm -hmm. declining to use force when the person says I own 10 houses, 10,000 houses and in house number 3025, this squatter was housing his family, sheltering his family from the storms, whatever, evict them, whatever. And the, the court would also say, well, actually, you own so much that we actually will uh, enforce 50 cents on the dollar or mm -hmm. something in that extent, meaning that's what I mean. Declining to use force right, right, right. is increasing force. OK, yeah. So. Uh... And with, but just to finish, it, and so yeah, I what I did conclude is yeah, if you had all those caveats where technically right. someone could do that, but it probably wouldn't make much money, because if if the idea is no, the life under the state is a lot worse than and right, you know, a lot who's going to be going to that place? Certainly not to live there. They might go there just for a weekend just to see what was it like living in Philadelphia in 1990. State life, <laughs> you know, I wouldn't think it. Yeah, right. <laughs> I wouldn't think it would be you know very like yeah, right, Co coercionville or something. That it would be very you know profitable and certainly things like setting income tax rates above the laffer point that's clearly a money loser like yeah you could have the right to do that but you would be losing money but what, what's the upshot? I mean? so if somebody recreated the state uh through private property voluntary acquisition right what what uh most libertarians would say yep that's fine now we could have the state right because it's voluntary or what i was so what i was arguing was it uh it was it'd be tricky to even get to that spot but if you did it would not be stable like okay. so it's so well, it is stable you... now i would say the other way is that there's practically no place on earth where a stateless society can endure for long because these states just encroach on it at the very least their neighbors will encroach on it so uh well but i think it's an important point but, but right so it's in other words like if the u.s executive branch were a hereditary monarchy i think their policies would be a lot more sensible than they are right now so it really does matter that there's this apparatus that people take four year control over. And then there's another big fight again about who gets control of that machinery. And so you get what I'm saying? So that, that's part of what I'm getting at there, that if it really were, you know, the standard property rights and someone for just some reason just mimicked the current state, they would realize like, well, this isn't making me very much, it'd be a lot more profitable to have more sense of these. You're, you're right. And that's an interesting topic. I think if mm -hmm. we, 
uh, have another call, right? Right. So I would love to get into that because a lot of people, uh, <clears throat> just like Anna Caps love private property, there's people who love democracy, right? And they say, mm -hmm. because we're a democracy, we're the best, we're the leader of the free world, etc. And despite all the CIA stuff, despite the 800 bases around the world, the military aggression, whatever mm -hmm. that we do, and uh, overthrowing governments, but we're a democracy. And to that, I say, well, you know, a democracy is one form of government, but the state apparatus is the problem. Like, yeah, you could actually in some way, and uh, I, I think that it's uh, offending the sensibilities of all the people on the left who are statists who say, oh, well, how can you say that a monarchy is better? Well, the thing is, like, if you make a treaty with a monarch, like the king of Morocco, and he's there 20 years later, right? At least you know that treaty is going to be somewhat respected, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas like the Iran deal, the North Korea deal, the Clinton negotiated, and heck, everything with the Native Americans, like from the founding of this country, like every single treaty, they said, white man speaks with forked tongue. Because like, right, right. you know, Thomas Jefferson says to Native Americans, if you assimilate, you're going to be fine. Then Andrew Jackson comes in is like, nope, you've assimilated, but you still have the trail of tears because like, and they even went in the Supreme Court. He's like, let them enforce it. Like, in other words, as administrations change, they seem to renege on what previous administrations yeah. have done. So, mm -hmm. um, okay, but so you're as far as the court. So I certainly like your approach, um, and I can imagine things like that. So, for example, if you know there's some cabin out in the middle of the woods, and a family gets lost, and they're going, and they're literally starving, and they see it, and you know, and it's all boarded, it's all locked up, like the people, the owners aren't there for the season, and you know, so you, you break the window and you go in, and there's food in the pantry, and you eat that. I can certainly, you know, I think the, you know, the ruling they they would treat that case certainly differently from, you know, just a standard burglar who just is going around casing houses and trying to steal women's mm -hmm. jewelry or something when they're not home, like yes. you know, it yep. would, it would, so not that it would just be totally free, but at the very least, they would just say, well, yeah, you got to compensate them for the stuff you took and the, you know, fix the glass, but we're not gonna we're not viewing you as criminal and that's certainly you right. know, that kind of thing. Right. I think so, it's more systemic, like, you know, yeah, are, right. So I'm just saying if, if I can give you that example, whereas to say, well, no, you came into my property, so I get to shoot you or something then. Well, I would say avoid, yeah. uh, avoid breaking in, just give these people housing, UBI, like health insurance, right. At the minimum. And that way they won't need to uh, break into and, and, and eat something. I, I got another real quick one example yeah. is, Walter Block has some real extreme thought experiments like, oh, if, you know, let's say you're flying your plane and you realize some eight-year-old kid snuck on the plane when you were loading your luggage, you didn't realize, and now you're over the Atlantic. Strictly speaking, you can open the thing and say, get off my property. You know, I, I don't think I'm putting words in his mouth. I think, you know, I mean, he's saying you shouldn't do that ethically. Right, right. I think he's saying you did not violate anybody's rights by doing that. All right, let me speed up a little and, bit. Let me show and I and, and I, I would disagree. I would say I don't think any normal legal system is gonna say that's a legal thing for you to do. All right. Uh we have maybe like 10, 15 minutes left. I want to just mm -hmm. really quickly go through this. Um and then maybe we could do this again. So, you know, another time uh we'll have another hour maybe to uh finish this out because there's so much uh to discuss. Um mm -hmm. uh, here, so here is um a vision of what I see. When I say libertarian socialism, I just want to be clear. Uh, mm -hmm. What I mean by libertarian socialism is the textbook definition of socialism. Actually, uh, so so here are the definitions. Anarcho-capitalism, right, is uh, anti-statist, libertarian, and seeks to abolish centralized states in favor of stateless societies with systems of private property enforced by private agencies, okay? Uh, libertarian socialism is also against the state. Anti-authoritarian, anti-capitalist. It emphasizes self-governance and a collective, uh, mm -hmm. you know, voluntary collective and uh, worker self-management is contrasted with other forms of socialism by its rejection of state ownership. OK, mm -hmm. um, and there's also like many um, even the state uh, socialists had this idea um, of withering away of the state. OK, mm -hmm. so even these guys, uh, or Bakunin, uh, Kropotkin, whatever, these guys were thinking that the state would do less and less until eventually there will be no state and communities would run. This is what it looks like today in the um, in the United States. Okay, I grew up in one of these things. Here's the video. It's a two minute uh, video. Here you go. I'm taking the, a day before the show. And as you can see, there's people raising their families here. There's people that have lived in these buildings for a few decades. And here's the thing. The grounds are very well kept, and yet this 
is a socialist housing cooperative. This is a product of the Mitchell Llama program. They have cooperatives like this throughout New York City. And what happens is there's no landlord. The people collectively own the housing cooperative. Across the street are buildings built by Fred Trump. And what happens is that those buildings were privatized. There was an option for the cooperators to vote to privatize the buildings into, I suppose, condos. Now what happens is that the rent there is twice or three times the rent here, which is called maintenance here. And um, there is a landlord. Some of these buildings are managed by a company. I lived here in these buildings. They're pretty much the same, obviously, as the other, as these. Uh, the park may not be as good or whatever, but the apartments now, uh, the market has raised the rates a lot more. So you could see the people vote with their feet and there's a line around the block to get into these. There isn't any more a line around the block to get into those. Um, there's definitely uh, vacancies over there. Finally, another form of social ownership is this credit union that was downstairs where I grew up. And so you see here, Consumers Fred, uh, Federal Credit Union, just one of many throughout the country, where again, there is no shareholder class. No one extracts rents from the two sides of the marketplace, in this case being the uh, lenders and the borrowers. Instead, the lenders and borrowers own the organization together, just like the housing cooperative. They decide what the policies would be, what the interest rates would be, and ultimately they lend to each other. So these are examples of socialism, as this textbook definition would imply, the collective ownership of the means of production. They could replace the word means of production with collective ownership of the organization. In other words, each person kind of has one share, one vote, as opposed to these, where the landlord has all the shares and all the votes. So that's, um, were you able to catch that? Uh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's what I mean. I think socialism is embedded throughout the country. We just don't see it uh, because uh, we're so used to saying that the U.S. is, uh, is a capitalist uh, country. But in fact, uh, credit unions, worker-owned cooperatives, uh, housing cooperatives, food cooperatives, all of these are voluntary associations where there is no landlord class. There is no shareholder class. The people who uh, are the stakeholders are the ones who own it. And one person has one vote rather than being able to have uh, uh, 50 votes because they can buy the votes uh, as shares. So that's, that's uh, I just want to illustrate specifically what I mean when I say uh, libertarian socialism. It's that. Okay, yeah. Um, and I don't know if you know this, but part of my professional work is I do a lot on, in the life insurance uh, sector. And there, we, yeah, we, we were advising people, if possible, get your policy from a mutual company. Where, you know, where the policyholders are the owners of the company on a separate class of shareholders and for various, for probably similar reasons that, you know, to say, because you don't want them trying to just, you know, juice the numbers for their next quarterly report. You want them making decisions based on the long-term viability of the company, that sort of thing. So, yeah, if that's what you mean by libertarian socialism, then I certainly don't have a problem with it. And possibly I'm a libertarian socialist myself. Um, one thing that I would mention, though, just in terms of your analysis in that video real quickly is, you said that oh here there's a there's a line you know around the block to get into the the cooperative housing whereas in the market the rent and you know rental units across the street there's there's vacancies and so in a healthy society you you need both because if you had a line across the street to get in that means there'd be a lot of homeless people right so there is something to be said for you know charging what the market will bear to make sure that there's you know quantity allocated to everybody and i agree with that by the way you, you make a good point too just like if you have a medicare for all but then you should have like a medicare advantage right or some some way to uh to to jump ahead uh but it should be limited i mean there should be some balance as opposed to completely privatized health by the way even if in, in the in the uh, economies like hong kong and mm -hmm. singapore which consistently topped the list of the heritage foundation's economic uh uh, freedom index. Mm -hmm. It turns out, I looked it up, that Hong Kong 
and Singapore, Hong Kong, for example, is you know a big safety net and now uh, welfare because there's a ton of poverty. Okay, it's huge poverty. Twenty percent of people are below the poverty line. Twenty percent, but it also has government run um, government run uh, hospitals. Mm -hmm. Like half of the hospitals are government run, and so you walk in, you get treatment for free. Uh, as far as I know, and, and 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 here's the thing, right? Is that it's paid for by the taxes, it, and these countries are the top of the economic freedom list. So I don't think economic freedom is, uh, a, is sacrificed by having, even beyond public uh, health insurance, having public hospital, public run, government run hospitals. So I'm saying like the it's a false fear mongering that they have in this country that if we had a merely a health insurance that everyone had, then um, it would somehow become uh, less economically free when the the countries that have the top the list of economic freedom, fifty percent of them are actually government run hospitals in there. So, you know, yeah, I I think am I back? Yes, yes. Yeah, I think it was oh, sorry, sorry. I apologize. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah I so I still think that yeah i would want there to be a completely voluntary property right so yeah maybe that's the thing too is to clarify so right what i am really for is a voluntary system that does you know involve property rights where no where no one's legitimately acknowledged property rights are violated on a systematic basis but i think what you're saying is yeah but you just want to change like what what does that entail to say you're the does that mean you know that, that well, actually, like in the in the Bible, right? That you know, if you were a landowner, that and you know, poor people were going by, they could come in and take like the the fruit that had fallen on the ground. Like that was just kind of a, a given. Like you you weren't supposed to, you know. Yeah, I'm saying we need to see. I'm saying that. safety nets. Like I want the yeah. market system to operate. They call this social democracy. Having a tax, yes, taxing, yes. Ta but I'm saying taxation is not force. If you simply. It, let me ask you this. If I abolish the individual income tax, I'm in favor of abolishing the individual income tax mm -hmm. and just taxing corporations and companies because they already have accountants and they already know how much they're paying the employees. It doesn't make sense for individual people to go to their local accountant and each one has a, an accountant um, when they're just going to report the same information as their employer could report and withhold. Milton Friedman mm -hmm. came up with withholding taxes. You, you know, I don't think there's many guns involved in withholding uh, those taxes. So I would say, would you agree that if we abolish the individual income tax and only tax corporations, robots, like things like this, then it would be a, a little bit more uh, palatable. And then we could pay for, remove money from the economy and pay for all these things in a sense. So, well, I mean, certainly if you're saying one possible change we're considering is getting rid of the individual income tax, yes or no, I say, yeah, go ahead and get rid of it. <laughs> <laughs> and I even agree if you said choose, get rid of the individual or the corporate, I'd say, yeah, get rid of the individual. But I would still want to get rid of the corporate. Now, again, it, like I'm okay with there being HOA fees. You know what I mean? So I, I think I'm okay with a lot of what you're talking about. It's just I'm concerned about how do we get there is to make it as voluntarily voluntary a process as, as possible. Great. And I, next time we're mm -hmm. going to talk about that because I'm a big decentralist, right? I think local mm -hmm. communities should be the ones – having their own currency, giving it out to people as a UBI and taxing it back as a local community. Right now we have big federal governments. I don't think they're gonna roll out a UBI. You know, I think a UBI increases liberty and we can talk about that next time. But uh, I think you and I agree, if we have these voluntary you know, communities and people voluntarily decide to use a credit card or the community's credit card, right? Then if they're subsidizing the community's roads that way, then everything is uh, up and up. I guess all I'm asking is like, if we got rid of the individual income tax with the big government, okay, let's let's now mm -hmm. say that there is a big government. If they got rid of the individual income tax, but they raised taxes on corporations and the corporations increasingly lay off people and replace them with robots and chat GPT and all this stuff, right? Why do you feel, why feel sorry for these corporations? They're not human. They're just entities and they employ robots. Like the future could just be taxing that sector and people could just get free money from all those robots doing the work like why well, i feel sorry for robots you know or the shareholders of these corporations well you finally came to the end i mean so there still would be people involved and it would be to, in the current system it would be what their property was and so yeah if you want to make an argument and trace it back and say well yeah but they got 
the property through coercive means or the state gave them advantages and in a genuine free market, they wouldn't be, yeah. you know, they're owners of all these corporations. You can make that argument. But to me, that, that would be the, the, the approach. It wouldn't merely just be to say of stock means, you know, I think they're because, because lots of individuals through the retirement right now are shareholders also. It's not literally that there's these different classes of, of people. Well, their pension funds have invested in shares because things like the government came in 2020, the Fed simply injected money into the public stock market. Like they're they're propping up this system of shareholding, right? Sure, sure. Mm -hmm. And I think if the government wasn't propping up that system of shareholding, right, then uh, the shareholders have already won. Like look at all these banks for 30 years of extracted value and some banks failed and the shareholders went to zero. You take a risk when you're a shareholder, right? You, you agree to risk. So if one of the risks happens to be that we tax you, right, that's just another risk of uh, that they'll factor in. So I'm thinking then the pension funds will rebalance. And you know that better than I do because you deal with insurance funds. But my point is, I don't think that this is my main point is I don't think that shareholding and property rights in other people's uh, stuff should be sacrosanct to the extent that you can't infringe on it at all. I think that uh, just like we have bankruptcy protection, other things that we rebalance to people's welfare, right? The people don't go to prison, that they, they have a mm -hmm. fresh start. Or the fact that we have uh, universal health insurance, many countries that people can have life-saving surgeries. Similarly, I think that uh, in the future, the shareholding class is already taking on risks, right? Your shares could go down for any number of reasons, new competitor or whatever. Taxing could be one of those reasons. I don't see that as being necessarily, uh, you know, we can't put any risk on shareholders at all. I think money could come out of that uh, class of people. I don't know. They're free. Oh, to be yeah. They're free. To yeah. yeah. Last thing I got to say, and then I got to, I got to go as, yeah. um, sure. So I definitely agree that, you know, if this change in the, in the legal enforcement is well known ahead of time and it just says, okay, starting, you know, next January 1st, if you start a corporation, at least in this, you know, in our, in our city here, then, you know, the, this is the, this is the playbook. And just keep in mind, we are going to periodically have a vote to see how much we can take to, you know, pay for the street lights and whatever. And, you know, and, and maybe it only goes up to a certain amount. So I, I'm definitely OK with that. Again, it's just it's tricky if you're changing the rules for things that are already up and running that, you know, th that's my only uh, I see. issue. Mm -hmm. All right. Lovely. Robert Murphy, it has been a pleasure, as I expected. Uh, let's continue this another time. And uh, thanks for stopping by. OK, thanks, Greg. Yeah, this was great. Likewise. Like to be the first to hear about Intercoin's roadmap and news? Definitely join and subscribe to the channel. Don't forget to click that little notification button so you can get updates when the next video drops and the next time we interview a legend like Noam Chomsky or Patrick Friedman. And if you would like to participate in the conversation, go to community.intercoin.app. We'd love to hear from you and about your community. This is what the project is all about. Intercoin, bringing power to the people.